Good morning. As everybody is joining us, I do want to take some time to introduce myself. My name is Cindy Reyes, a financial education manager at EdFed, and I want to welcome all of you to another EdFed Academy webinar. Today's webinar is on cybercrime, titled Safeguarding Your Digital Life. And today, we're super excited to have a really special guest with us. But before I get there, I do want to let you know about EdFed Academy. It is our education platform, my financial ed platform, where we offer webinars and workshops on various topics really to offer members financial ed and product solutions for all of our members. We're excited to bring you this one today specifically because we know that cybercrime, um, it's a big threat to us all. So many of our interactions today are all online, right? We are very, we're all living a very digital life. So whether it be messaging with our family, emailing at work, online purchases, even booking online reservations for vacations, um, even our home security network, a lot of these things are all online. So it is imperative that we take the proper precautions to ensure that all of these interactions, as well as our transactions, are safe. Um, and today we will learn how we can protect ourselves online. I do want to go ahead and introduce our presenter. His name is Luis Cruz. He is the Chief Information Officer at EdFed with 26 years of experience in technology, including 20 years specifically in credit union industry. He brings a wealth of expertise and insight into the field of cybersecurity. As the CIO at EdFed, he continues to drive innovation and implement robust security measures, ensuring the safety and security of the credit union and its members. Uh, before I pass it over to him, I, go, I, I wanna go ahead and cover what we will be reviewing today in this workshop, all about cybersecurity, some statistics, um, what are these cyber criminals seeking? How do they seek this information, right? Some data gathering methods, um, a little bit about password security, which is really what's gonna be at the forefront of, of protecting us, um, confidence scams and social engineering, tips to protect ourselves, yourself, um, and really what to do if you fall victim. At the end, we will have some time for questions. Um, I do want to remind everybody that everybody has been muted for the duration of our workshop. And so if you have any questions, please feel free to put them on the Q&A feature that's located at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, that way we can get to them at the end of our workshop. But for now, I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to Luis Cruz. Thank you so much, Luis, for being with us today. I'm going to allow you to share your screen. Thank you uh, for that introduction, Cindy. My name is Louis Cruz, and as Cindy mentioned, I'm Chief Information Officer here at EdFed. Um, we're going to be talking about cybersecurity today. Uh, cybersecurity, it's its a topic that's near and dear to my heart. Uh, I love talking about this. I love sharing the information with people uh, because, you know, I've seen firsthand what cyber criminals can do to people and how they, how they destroy lives. Uh, you know, people can lose hundreds of thousands of dollars on you know on being victims of cybercrime, uh, and so it's really important for us to talk about this and for everyone to be uh, aware of this topic. And you know what what really is cybersecurity, and why is this so important to talk about it? Well, you know we've mentioned that um, it's it's important to talk about this because we live in such a connected world. You know we have so many devices that that are connected to the internet and. You know, growing up, we've been we we're taught to protect ourselves, our physical security. You know, we know not to walk down a dark alley. You know, if you leave your car in a parking garage, you're not going to leave valuables out in open sight, right? But on average, people spend more than seven hours of their lives connected to or with devices that are connected to the internet. And so, who's teaching us? You know, what what is safe to do online? You know, what apps are safe to download? what emails are safe to open and look at and, and click on. And so that is what we're gonna be talking about today. Um, and so that's what cybersecurity about, is about. It's about protecting ourselves online, uh, protecting our information and our financial assets uh, online, okay? And um, when it comes to things that are connected online, you know, we, we know the typical devices. You got your phones, you got, watches, you got fitness bands, you know, computers, all sorts of things that are connected. But I did a little bit of research to find, you know, what other things are connected, because nowadays, it's just crazy the amount of things that are connected to the internet and accessible to these cyber criminals, right? So I found some weird things. <clears throat> uh, a toaster, uh, which sends a can send you a text message or a push notification when your toast is ready. That's useful. Uh, you got refrigerators, right? People have seen these for now a couple years where you know, it'll tell you if your milk and eggs are low and it can even reorder those items for you. 
Uh, I'm not sure why you would want a deodorant stick that's connected to the internet, but they got that too, right? And then um, the other one here is a uh, toilet that's connected to the internet so that, you know, I, I don't know, it logs your business. I'm not sure why you want that, but it, there it is. You know, we have a lot of weird things connected to the internet. Um, and so we have to be careful. And then of course there are cars that more and more are becoming dependent on internet connections and computers uh, to perform their critical functions. And so it's super important for us to, you know, be aware uh, that cyber criminals are out there and that they're going after the data uh, that comes in and out of all these devices that we're using on a daily basis. And another thing that's important for us to know is that 59% of people in the United States uh, were victims of cybercrime last year. Okay, that's almost 200 million Americans that were directly impacted by cybercrime. Okay, it's uh, it, it's it's a massive amount, uh, and the costs of that are are starting to add up. So last year, uh, $12.5 billion were lost uh, through direct cyber attacks on individuals, right, on American consumers. And that's estimated to increase by 30% to $16 billion this year. So it's, uh, it, it's something that is being investigated by law enforcement across the United States, really across the world. Um, these criminal hackers are essentially stationed or, or they live all around the world. Uh, and they're attacking us for various reasons. And uh, cybercrime is actually reported every 35 seconds in the United States. There's one cybercrime reported every 35 seconds. This is actually an underrepresented amount because a lot of cybercrime doesn't get reported at all. Um, people are either ashamed that they fell for a scam. Uh, they Most of them don't even know that they can report it to you know police or the authorities. And so a lot of this crime is not getting reported. Um, we expect this number to be uh, a lot higher. Uh, and so it's uh, you know important that we talk about this a lot. Um, so why do people do this? Why, uh, why, why do cyber criminals exist? Well, it's, little, it's important to talk a little bit about the history of cyber uh, or hackers kind of to, to go into this. In the early days of the internet, right? Think the early nineties when computers and the internet first started to kind of coexist together. Um, you had hackers that came into the scene, you know, and mostly in those days, people thought of hackers as, you know, people that lived in their basement, just clacking away at their keyboard um, and breaking into websites, right? And in the early days of the internet, it was mostly true that that's what hackers did. They just kind of hacked into a website, uh, defaced a website, and, and that was the end of it. Uh, so in those days, you had your website, right? And... Wait, actually, that doesn't look like a website from the early 90s, right? Okay, that's better. That's a website from the early 90s. You had your website and uh, you had a hacker and he was just in his basement and his goal was to just hack it, deface your website, you know, put his tagline on there and put a shout out to his friends. Um, the goal was achievement, recognition, and that was pretty much it. But something happened over the last two decades or so. The internet started changing. Uh, we started to do more transacting online. It became more of a financial hub, right? Where you know the internet was commoditized into a you know storefronts and and people doing financial transactions, um, and so it became uh, a new playing ground for criminals, right? And these hackers of the early '90s, um, while some of them are still around, right, and they exist for recognition and all that cyber crime was taken over by organized crime, right? And so now these cyber criminals, uh, it's not the hackers that were, you know, that are in pop culture or, you know, that you find in the movies um, in the 90s and the 2000s. These are really criminals that are part of organized crime rings, right? And so that's what we're talking about when we talk about these cyber criminals. So what motivates hackers or cyber criminals today? Uh, it's really just about financial gain for the most part. Like I said, there's still a small subset uh, that are out there for recognition. Uh, there's a few hackers or cyber criminals that do this for political activism. They have a cause, uh, particular groups that they're going after that they don't agree with. Uh, and then there's the state sponsored actors who, you know, there are certain nation states that have uh, hackers on their payroll. Uh, and then, you know, they're after their own uh, nation interests and things of that nature. 
but primarily we're talking about financial gain, right? That is the uh, the crux of it, and that is what uh, most cyber criminals are after these days, right? And what they want from you, what these hackers are trying to get after, are two things: they want your identity and they want your money. So they want your sensitive data um, or your money, right? And they're going to get this uh, either by one of two ways. They're going to get it either directly from you or they're going to get it from organizations that you have provided that to, right? So think your healthcare provider, your financial institutions. I mean, even your, your internet service provider and your cell phone companies, you're giving them your personal data all the time. You know, every time you go and get a cell, uh, uh, you register with a new or a cell phone provider, you have to give them your social security number. You have to give them, you know, all sorts of personal information. Um, and then you have to trust that company to take care of that information the same way that you would, right? So how do the hackers do this? Well, there's actually many steps involved uh, in them taking that information or taking the money from you, but it all starts with social engineering, right? And social engineering can be thought of as psychological manipulation. So they use kind of psychology and, and manipulation techniques to gain trust and exploit human emotions. So things like happiness and curiosity and desire, you know, fear and anxiety, generosity. Hackers or these, these criminals will, they'll focus in on people and they'll take advantage of them, their emotional state, their psychological state. And these guys are masterminds at doing this. Um, and they'll, they'll use those techniques and those tactics to get after you and steal your information and steal your money. And when it comes to phishing, we're going to, we're going to talk about that in particular right now because um, it's probably the most used method uh, for social engineering. Uh, phishing is social engineering that's carried out through email, right? And so um, it's carried out through email. We'll see that some of it is also carried out through uh, phone calls and text messages, uh, but we'll talk about that in a bit. We're going to focus in on phishing right now. Uh, because like I said, it's the most used social engineering that uh, that these cyber criminals go after. And it's also the first step uh, that they take to try to get after your money and your uh, sensitive information. And so when it comes to a phishing email, um, a lot of people call this spam uh, or malicious emails. Uh, phishing is a term that's uh, becoming more and more popular these days um, among non-technical people. Uh, but it's really, they send you an email um, and the email is is forged in a specific way to try to get you to do one of three things, right? The criminals either want you to click on a link or something in their email. They want you to open an attachment that they've sent you, or they just want you to respond to them, right? Because when you respond to them, they start engaging with you on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And at that point, things can get really dangerous, okay? So how they do this is, you know, we talked about the psychological manipulation, uh, but they'll use uh, urgent language. Uh, you know, the tone of their email will be kind of sometimes scary. Uh, they'll, they'll use fear a lot. Um, or conversely, they can send you emails that sound too good to be true, right? But you're excited and happy and curious, right? They're using the other spectrum of your, your emotions to try to get to you, right? It could be fear-driven or it could be, you know, happiness-driven uh, that they can get to you. So a lot of times when people see something that's too good to be true, their excitement and their, their happiness and their curiosity takes over. Um, and even though they know that it's probably not true, they'll still click on those things. Uh, and then lastly, it's uh, threatening is another one. You know, you'll see this a lot when you get an email and it looks like it's from your bank or your credit union. And it tells you that you have fraud on your account and you have to click here, you know, to validate your identity and to make sure that, you know, the fraud gets stopped. Um, it generally drives people to clicking on those links uh, because they're scared and they, you know, they want to act fast. Again, using that threatening email, going back and tying it to the urgencies factor as well. So another way to detect uh, phishing is uh, look at the things that the email are, is asking you to do. Uh, is it asking you to update something, validate something, validate your identity or verify your identity? right? A lot of the phishing emails are always going to ask you to click links on them, right? Of course, we get a lot of spam and a lot of uh, emails from social media and, and other sources that are going to ask you to click on things. Uh, but these are just additional red flags that when you tie into 
other aspects, other ways of detecting these phishing emails, they start to add up, right? And they start to paint the picture of this being a fake email, okay? If they ask you to do anything like update your details or validate your identity or verify your account, right? Those are, are clear red flags I have to keep in the back of your mind. So when you get an email, here are some things that you can do uh, to check if it's a phishing email or not. First, you wanna start with reviewing the sender information, right? So who is that email coming from, right? The, the, the sender email address. A lot of times that's gonna be a forged email address, right? Or it's gonna be something that's, uh, uh, they, they kind of change the name of, of the email domain to make it seem like a legitimate source. Uh, they may use something like Microsoft.com, right? But they'll misspell Microsoft um, or they'll forge it like as if like if it's coming from a government address. Um, sometimes it will be misspelled, uh, but some good uh, criminal hackers can forge it so that it looks perfect uh, and you won't be able to tell, right? So this is just, again, one red flag that you can look at. Uh, if you know the person that it's coming from, but that email just seems weird or out of character for that person, you really should question it. And it's another red flag to keep at the back of your mind, right? So you probably shouldn't respond to an email from your grandma Lulu who's demanding you to pay an invoice, right? That's out of character for her. And the reason that something like that would happen is because when hackers take over somebody else's email address or their email account, one of the first things they do is use that account to send out a whole bunch of other phishing emails to everybody who that person has previously emailed or everybody who's in their contact list, right? And so, you know, if your grandma or your, you know, friend or whoever has ever emailed you, well, and that hacker takes over their account, well, you're going to get a weird email from that person. You're going to recognize that person and be like, oh, it's just an email from my friend. Um, wait a minute, this is a weird email. Why is my friend asking me to pay an invoice or why are they asking me to you know, verify my whatever, you know, those are things that you should probably pay attention to. Um, and one of the best things to do is to call that person directly or text them at a known number, right? And then validate if what they're asking you to do is true and why. Inspect links uh, that are in an email. So anything they ask you to click on, one of the best things you could do is just hover over that link. Don't click on it, right? But if you're on a computer, this is what it looks like. You just hover your mouse over that link. And again, don't click. Um, and when you do that, a little pop-up is gonna come up, right? And it's gonna reveal the, the address or the URL that you'd go to when you click or tap on that link, right? And so you can clearly see here that this looks uh, like it's a email, an email from the US Department of Labor. Uh, but in reality, it's a, fish, it's a phishing email. It's a fake email. And when you click on that link, it's taking you to some malicious website that'll probably steal your password. So again, we talked about the urgent and the threatening language. Uh, just be careful with emails that are, you know, unlikely good fortunes. You've won a lottery or sweepstakes that you never applied for in the first place. Uh, those are very common scams. Uh, look for incorrect grammar or spelling, although that's becoming less and less of a common red flag because a lot of hackers are now using AI and things like chat GPT to create emails and to check their grammar. Um, you know, in the, in the older days, uh, since these crimes are mostly perpetrated by uh, foreign uh, people from other countries, they're not that good with writing English. And so they would, it would come across as broken or, or bad grammar, broken English or bad, bad grammar. Um, but uh, like I said, that's becoming less and less of a thing now with AI. Uh, looking at, and also look for those keywords that we talked about, you know, update, verify, validate, or click anywhere. All right, so now let's go through this. I want you guys to take a look at this email and try and see if you can identify some of the red flags, right? This is clearly a phishing email. I'll start with that. Uh, but if you can identify some of the red flags in this email, then you're off to a great start. And I'm not just talking about this red flag up here. All right, so... First, I'll start with this right here. Government is misspelled, right? And it's a .info domain name, right? The government doesn't use .info domain name. So that's a, a clear red flag right there. This is not an email from the US government or the IRS, right? We have urgent language here. 
we have the IRS logo, which by the way, anyone can just go to the IRS website and copy the logo and paste it onto their email. That's a super easy thing for anyone to do. Uh, it's using a generic greeting. It's using the keywords that we talked about, verify your account information, You know, log in, click this link. Uh, and then it has kind of an unprofessional signature line at the end here. Uh, also not to mention that the IRS will probably never email you. Uh, so that's another red flag on itself. All right, so that's a, uh, we just got through phishing and emails, which is again, the most common way that these uh, cyber criminals are gonna go after you uh, when it comes to phishing. But another very common method is calls and text messages, right? And when it comes to calls and text messages, those who are in the cybersecurity industry refer to this as smishing for text phishing, right? Or vishing for voice calls uh, when they do phishing through voice calls. All right. You don't have to remember that, but it's just kind of something fun to know. Uh, a lot of us, probably all of us have received the text messages, right? Your Amazon package is delayed. You know, Bank of America is closing your bank account. If you don't click here and validate your account, uh, your Apple ID is expired. Your account is suspended, right? It's all fear driven or, or you know, causing us to, to kind of that sense of urgency, like, hey, yeah, I do have an Amazon package out there. Who doesn't, right? Who doesn't have a pending Amazon package that's being delivered? So those these criminals, they feed on that uh, and they'll send those messages saying your Amazon package is delayed um, and people will click on those links. One of my personal favorites is the CEO tech scam, right? If you're working at an organization, it's likely that you received this one. Uh, these cyber criminals will research individuals, right? They'll pick a company, find out who the CEO is, and then try to find individuals working at that organization and their cell phone numbers. And then they'll send them a text message, right? And they've done their research. They know your name. So it's exactly like it looks there. Hey, Dale, this is Bob, your CEO. I'm in a meeting and can't call you. Can you please do me a favor? I need some gift cards. You know, go to the corner of Walmart and just buy me a stack of gift cards. I'm, I'm going to give them out to employees as a gift or as a recognition. Needless to say, this is not your CEO texting you. And what you should do is verify with your CEO in person or by calling them or by calling your boss to find out if this is legitimate, right? This is such a common scam and so many people fall for this uh, that it's definitely worth mentioning here. Okay, so when it comes to voice calls, uh, some of the most common things that these uh, cyber criminals are gonna go after, right, is your bank account, right? So when they call you, they pretend to be like, they, they pretend like they're calling you and they're uh, a representative from your bank or credit union. And the thing that they'll use most common is that they'll tell you that they're, they've detected fraud on your account and they need you to validate your identity so that they can help you, right? This gets people uh, it, it throws you completely off because it gets you into the fear mode, right? And it makes you bypass your critical thinking completely, right? So many times the banks and credit union tell folks, we will never call you and ask you for your identifying information, right? When you call the bank directly, you call the credit union or a bank directly, sure, they're going to ask you for information to validate or identify you, but you've called them, right? If you are receiving a phone call, from your financial institution, and they are asking you to verify or validate your identity, you should probably hang up at that point and call back your bank or credit union at a phone number that you know is legitimate, okay? So what they'll do with this financial account takeover is they'll call you, they'll scare you by telling you that there's fraud on your account, right? And then they'll go through a very elaborate scheme uh, to make you give up your account information, things like your password, uh, you know, your your, other types of credentials and sensitive data, maybe your social security number, your date of birth, they'll use that information and they'll take over your online bank account. And then they will either use your account for other illegal activity, or they'll use your bank or credit union account to, you know, empty it out and transfer the funds elsewhere. Tax and IRS scam calls, um, very popular during tax season. Um, you know, the I actually received uh, an email uh, from the Florida State Governor the other day, uh, warning of these IRS scam text messages, emails, and calls. 
Uh, they're again very prevalent during tax season, but uh, it could be other times, of, especially after tax season is over, when people start receiving those scam calls saying that the IRS never received your filing and that they're going to uh, issue a warrant for your arrest and things like that. An IRS, the IRS is never going to issue a warrant for your arrest and they're never going to call you. They're going to send you an official letter in the mail uh, and that's how they're going to communicate with you, right? So, you know, you have to be careful with those as well. Offers that are too good to be true, right? I've gotten these myself. They call me and they tell me, hey, you've won. You can either pick from a TV, a, a you know, a two-week vacation uh, or a new car. And I'm like, first, why would anyone ever pick a TV when compared to those other two? Uh, and, and secondly, what did I ever, you know, what did I ever apply for that I want anything? So you have to be careful with these things. Uh, it can come in email, it can come in voice calls or even text messages. And then the medical and social security fraud is one that particularly targets um, uh, older Americans, older folks. Uh, you know, they'll they'll target you and they'll say, you know, there's something wrong with your Medicare or there's something wrong with your social security check. If you don't, you know, respond and, and verify your identity with us, you know, we're going to stop sending you the checks or or your insurance is going to get canceled. Um, it's all with the goal of getting your information, getting you to give them your social security number, your date of birth, all of your personal details, right? And when people are in those states of mind where, you know, they think that something so important is going to get canceled, uh, you know, they want to do anything. And so sometimes they'll even give up banking information that's completely unrelated to, you know, Medicare or their insurance or anything like that. So you just have to be, have to be very careful there. Some of the tactics that these uh, cyber criminals use um, to kind of to do these uh, each one of these uh, scam calls, they'll use caller ID spoofing, uh, which is when they call you, if you look at your phone and it it'll show up with the name of the organization that they're calling from, right? This is so easy to fake. Um, it's it's really not even funny. You can go on the internet and just you know go to a website that helps you to fake this. You don't have to even buy anything. Um, when somebody, uh, when you receive a phone call and it has the name of your bank or credit union, let's say you get a phone call and it says EdFed on it, right? And you answer the phone, you still have to pay attention to what the person is saying. And remember that we will never ask you for personally identifying information when we call you, right? Always call that organization back at a known phone number, right? Caller ID spoofing is something that's so common, you, you cannot rely on it. Um, and then AI voice cloning is something that's uh, a newer now with the new AI technology that's starting to emerge. Um, criminal hackers are starting to, it, with the technology that exists today, you really only need about three to five seconds of somebody's voice to be able to, to, be able to clone that voice. And so they're starting to use this voice cloning technology for very devious purposes. Um, and, and some of the scams that they're pulling off with this is just terrible. I mean, uh, fake kidnappings are some of the ones that they're doing. Well, they'll they'll find uh, maybe your 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 son or daughter posts a lot on social media or something, you know, or they do TikTok videos or something, and they'll get their voice print off of one of those videos, clone it, and then they'll call you with your son or daughter's voice and tell you that they've been kidnapped. It's terrible, but these criminal hackers are doing it, and everyone needs to be aware of it, right? How do you defend yourself? How do you you know protect yourself against that? Well. First, you, you know, hang up, call your son or daughter back and see if they are safe. You know, if you're, it, I recognize this is a, this is high fear factor and high anxiety factor, right? And you may not want to hang up, but definitely if you want, find another phone, call your son or daughter and verify that, you know, they're just, you know, they might just be okay. They might be out with their friends or something. Just be aware that this is happening and it's, it's terrible, but it is happening and you have to be aware that these scams occur. So how do you protect yourself? Again, when it comes to phishing and social engineering, uh, it can happen through email, it can happen through text or phone calls. And to protect yourself, you're going to need to make sure that you don't open any emails that you weren't expecting. Don't click on links or attachments for emails that you're where you don't know where they come from. Uh, don't respond to anyone uh, who you don't know right? Or emails that you're like, you're not familiar with. And don't answer texts or phone calls from unknown numbers. Just let them go to voicemail and then listen to the voicemail. And if you want to, you can call them back, right? 
It also helps to put people who you do talk to on a regular basis into your contact list. Uh, so when they call you, it doesn't seem like it's coming from an unknown number. Uh, when it comes to the do side of the house, do type in URLs or the addresses on, in links manually. So if you receive an email, right, and it looks like it's coming from your credit union, well, and you're you, maybe you're suspicious, you're not sure if it's really from your credit union or not. What you could do instead of clicking on the link in the email, just open up your browser, right? Type in www.edfed.org. Go to the credit union site directly instead of clicking on the link in that email, you know, and then log in and see what's going on with your account. Uh, be very cautious of those weird emails that come from people you do know. Remember that hackers will take over somebody's email account and then spam their contact list with all of their ma malicious emails and phishing attempts. Uh, verify requests uh, at known phone numbers. So if you receive a request through text message or email from somebody you, you do know, and it's just off or weird, just call that person uh, or text them at a known phone number to verify that they're actually asking you to do this kind of weird thing. Uh, and then use common sense. You know, that old adage, if it's too good to be true, it probably is, you know, common sense. When we are uh, inundated by all these, you know, phishing texts, calls from scammers, remember that they're gonna use the, the urgent, the fear, you know, the threatening language uh, or the really happy, excited language to try to get you to bypass your critical thinking and click on things and do things that you would normally not do. So take a deep breath, take a step back, you know, and just use some common sense uh, before you take any actions like clicking on links or, you know, downloading files or anything like that. So what happens if you do fall for a fish? Well, most likely what what will happen is you'll either get um, malware like viruses and things like that installed on your computer, uh, or more commonly, you'll be led to a website, uh, which is a, a fake website of your bank, your financial institution, your credit union, uh, where the uh, cyber criminals will ask you to log in, right? When they ask you to log in, and these websites, they're done very well. They clone the website of your bank or credit union almost perfectly, right? And so you think you're at your bank or credit union's website. Um, and then they'll ask you to log in. When you put in your username and password, uh, well, the hackers have now stolen your information uh, and they'll use that information to log in to your bank account and steal all your you know, money. Uh, a lot of times they're collecting username and passwords um, and then they'll take all of that and they'll sell it uh, to other uh, cyber criminals who go and do the, uh, the actual logging in and stealing money. Um, but yeah, there, it's just, uh, something that is, it's extremely dangerous when you fall for one of these fish. And, uh, if you recognize that you fall, fallen for one, one of the first things you should do is contact your financial institution and let them know, um, and definitely change your, your password on your, uh, on your credit union or bank account. And speaking of passwords, let's talk about password security, because that's also extremely important to, uh, our online, uh, security and protection. Did you know that 81% of hacking related breaches all involve uh, compromised and weak passwords? Now, a compromised password is when you've you've fallen for a phishing attack and then you've given up your password, right? To a, a fake uh, credit union or banking website, you know, or some other place. Um, passwords can also be stealing by hackers installing viruses and malware on your computer, uh, which will then uh, send back to the hacker all of your keystrokes right? Some of them, they're called password stealers. Um, they detect when you're logging into any account. It could be your bank. It could be your cell phone provider. It could be your, you know, government or insurance company. Um, and then they'll, they'll send those credentials, your username or password, and the site that you're logging into, they'll send all that back to the hackers. Um, you know, and then weak passwords uh, are, you know, when it comes to weak passwords, they're just so easy for the hackers to guess um, that you don't even have to give them up. So, what I like to say is, you know, treat your passwords like a toothbrush. This is just a tip to help you remember. Um, and that means, you know, choose a good one. Don't share them with anyone. Get a new one every three months and don't reuse an old one. All right. This is all common sense things to remember with your toothbrush. Um, and so when it comes to passwords, you know, treat them like a toothbrush. And so it, it can help you to remember uh, what you should do. I like this question when I'm when I'm doing these presentations in person, I often get people shouting out their passwords. And I'm like, no, no, that's not, that's not the intent of the question. It's a, re it's a rhetorical question. <laughs> Don't tell me what passwords you are using. Uh, but I, the, the point of the question is, 
you know, we want to find out if your passwords are strong enough, right? And everyone's heard these strong password guidelines, right? You have to have long passwords. You have to have uppercase and lowercase and numbers and special characters in your password. And all those things are important. But I will say by far the most important criteria is long passwords. Okay, sure, you have to have those other things in there, but you don't have to make crazy passwords that you can't remember, right? You just have to make long passwords that you could remember, right? So here's some examples of some bad and some good passwords, right? Bunny49, okay, you got uppercase, you got lowercase, and you got numbers. You got three of those in there, right? It should be good, but that's just such a weak password that it takes a computer one minute to hack it, right? And this is just through something called brute force where you have a special computer program just goes through every single word in the dictionary uh, and tries to hack your password. Pony and horse 90, eh, it's medium level strength, but a computer could still hack that in about five days. Now this is it, this looks like a strong password, right? It's so complicated, it's got so many things in it. Um, it it's a little bit strong, but in reality, it'll take a computer two months to just brute force that password by just going through every single letter uh, in the in in every single characters, right? In the alphabet and the number set, and a special character set. Um, computers nowadays, two months and your password is done. Um, and people aren't usually changing their passwords every two months. So this would be a compromise or a weak password at this point. What about this one? Hey, one can remember this, right? You got uppercase, you got lowercase, you got exclamation point, which is a special character, the period. This is a super easy password to remember, yet it's one of the strongest ones on this list. And a computer program that's doing brute force cannot hack this password in somebody's lifetime, right? And so it's super easy for someone to remember. And then I always get the question of, of whether can I put spaces in my password or not, right? Generally, I'd say probably about 80, 90% of systems on the internet will allow you to put passwords uh, on, um, I'm sorry, spaces in your passwords. Not all of them do. I know that on our, our EdFed uh, digital banking doesn't allow you to do that. So I'm, I'm here saying it, but our, you know, we ourselves don't allow you to do that. Um, one way to get over uh, it, an, an alternative is to put underscores, right? Or dashes uh, there as well. Uh, but, you know, it's just an easier way to remember when you're using what's called a paraphrase instead of a password. So remember that the key to strong passwords is that there are longer passwords instead of uh, instead of complicated passwords. Um, and I will say that you still have to have the special characters and the uppercase and the lowercase. Uh, that's still important, right? Even if your password is long, you still need to have those, but you can put them in a way where it's super easy to remember it, right? You don't have to have these complicated, you know, passwords that you can't remember. Okay. And so here's another example, right? Of a good password. Um, and if you put this into the computer, uh, it's it's actually going to take 56 trillion years for the computer to try to brute force or, or crack your password, right? But it's something that could be easily remember remembered. All right, so when it comes to password security, here are some tips for you to remember. Again, choose long passwords. The longer the password, the stronger the password. Don't share your passwords with anyone. Uh, make sure you change your passwords. Uh, every three months is a good time to change them. You know, some people like to go out a little longer. Um, and then do not use the same password for multiple websites. This is one of the worst things you can do uh, because so many websites are getting hacked and breached so often that if 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 you're using your password, you know, for your Yahoo account, if you're using Yahoo email and you're using the same password for your credit union banking, right, your digital banking, um, if Yahoo gets breached, these hackers know that people use multiple passwords across different accounts. Who wants to remember 10, 12 different passwords, right? Nobody does. So it's just human nature for us to use same, the same passwords. Hackers know this. And when they get your password from your Yahoo account, they're going to go and try that on the most popular banking sites. You know, they're going to do a little bit of research to find out, you know, does this person have a credit union? You know, where, where do they do their banking? And they'll try that Yahoo password, right, in your credit union account, right? And nine times out of 10, eight times out of 10, they might get in with that password because people just commonly share passwords across sites. Two other tips that I'll give you guys is uh, use a password manager. Uh, this is a helpful tool uh, and use MFA. We'll get that to, to that one as well. But a password manager is a helpful tool. You've seen them uh, often if you have an iPhone or a, or a Google Android phone, 
Um, it'll say, hey, do you want me to remember this password? Do you want me to put this password into our, our, our keychain, right? That is a password manager, right? It's going to store all of your passwords in there in a secure vault. Uh, and then it's going to use one master password or your, your fingerprint or your face ID to unlock that password, right? Uh, there are webs, internet websites or, or web services that offer similar things um, off the top of my head. Um, I think there's one called 1Password, um, uh, Keeper. Uh, you know, there's a few of them. Uh, LastPass is another one. There's a few of them. I, I don't, I'm not going to recommend one or the other. I'm just saying that there's a few of them out there. Uh, that'll do this on desktop computers and that they have mobile apps. Um, certainly you can use the one on your iPhone uh, or on your Android phone. Um, but, you know, it's it's a helpful and easy way to maintain multiple passwords and that, you know, help you so you only have to remember one master password or you just use your face ID or your fingerprint to unlock your passwords. Uh, the benefits are this is uh, of the, these password managers is uh, that they store passwords with really high grade encryption. So it's really hard for hackers to get these passwords, even if they steal your phone or if they, or if they hack into that password vault company, um, the passwords are still stored with high grade encryption. Uh, you only need to remember one password or you use your, you know, your, your biometrics, your face ID, your fingerprint or something else. Uh, easily accessible on, on any device. You know, most of these companies it's either on your phone or you have an app and a desktop version, right? Uh, extra security with MFA. So they use multi-factor authentication, which we're going to talk about in a second. Uh, and then the master password uses irreversible encryption. So even if hackers got that master uh, password, the, the encrypted version of it, they're not going to be able to decrypt that password, right? And so there are a lot of benefits to this. This last one, um, a lot of these companies um, are scanning what's called the dark web to see if your password has been compromised, right? The dark web is kind of a marketplace where hackers are going to buy, sell, and trade, you know, sensitive data, password information, right? All of this, you know, if a hacker doesn't want to deal with it themselves, they can sell it in the dark web. And so um, a lot of these password managers will scan dark, the dark web as an additional uh, service for you and notify you when your password has been compromised, right? And so um, many financial institutions are starting to do this as well. You'll notice that if you log into your bank or credit union and uh, they immediately notify you, it's like, hey, the password you just logged in with um, was found in a breach and a password breach or was found on the dark web. That doesn't mean that your, your bank or credit union was hacked or breached. That means that you're probably sharing that password across multiple accounts or there's a password stealer or malware on your computer that you're using to log into your bank or credit union and you know your password has been compromised. So your banker credit union at that point is doing you a service and telling you it's probably a good idea to change your password for this site because it's on the dark web and you know it's accessible to hackers. MFA or multi-factor authentication, sometimes called two-factor authentication by many organizations, is a form of authentication that requires you to use two things, right? Uh, for you to get access to a site. So you could think of these two things as at least two of the following, either something you know, something you have, or something you are, right? So what do we mean by this? Well, let's, let's get into that and talk about this. Something you know, something you have, and something you are, right? So when, you, when we talk about something you know, it's something that you, that you have knowledge of. It could be a password, a PIN, or something like that. Uh, something you have could be a key, fob, a smartphone, right? It could be a... a a passcode that's sent to you as a text message, right? You don't know that until you receive it. So it's something that you you will have. Uh, and then something you are, it's like biometrics, right? It's a fingerprint, uh, a, a, a voice verification or a face scan. <clears throat> so MFA, when you enable MFA, it's going to ask you for at least two of these so that you can log into or gain access to that site. Um, and it's important that you always, most websites, especially banking and uh, uh, credit union websites, um, are going to have MFA and the ability to turn that on. And it's always important. Like EdFed, we in our digital banking platform have the ability for our members to turn on MFA as an additional security factor. And we always recommend that every member turns that on. 
so that you're not, you're not just typing in your password to log into your account. It's also going to send you a text message or a push notification or something to validate that it's you who's logging into your EdFed account. Can MFA be hacked? Well, what do you guys think? Yeah, of course it could be hacked. You know, hackers are really smart and they can, they always find creative ways to get around all these security measures. It's, it's a cat and mouse game always, but MFA does enable a much higher level of security. So we always do recommend you turn it on, even though it can be hacked. How could it be hacked? Okay, so hackers hack MFA through social engineering, just like everything else, right? They, If you are sending MFA codes, like, like those one-time passcodes to your email, that's probably the weakest type of MFA, right? Because emails are so easy to get for these cyber criminals to get into. Uh, and if they want to get into your bank account, they're going to go into your email uh, and steal that code that you've sent yourself. Um, it could also be intercepted if you send it as a text message, although that's a lot more complicated for them to do, right? But, you know, social engineering, um, what they'll do is they'll call you on the phone, uh, tell you that you are you have fraud on your bank account, right? On your credit union account, whatever. Um, they'll tell you that they need to validate your identity and that they're going to send you a one-time passcode and that they want you to read that passcode back to you, okay? Um, and then you're saying, well, how can they do that, right? I only get a one-time passcode when I'm logging into my account and I hit, you know, enter or submit. Well, unfortunately, that hacker has already gotten your username and your password, right? And you have MFA turned on, so they can't log in until they have that code. So what they're doing is they're, they're sitting at their computer, they're typing in your username and your password, and they have you on the phone, right? And the minute that they're telling you, hey, I'm going to send you a one-time passcode to verify your identity, they're hitting enter on the computer to log into your account. And now, you know, the, the credit union has sent you a passcode, right? Because you're trying to log into your account. And that person's on the phone telling you, hey, I've just sent you a password to validate or a passcode to validate your identity. Can you read that back to me? The minute you give that up, you've lost access to your account. So remember, the credit union, your financial institutions will never call you and ask you for this information. Okay, let's talk about malware real quick. There's different types of malware. Usually it always starts with social engineering phishing, right? Or you visit a website that has malware and it gets onto your computer. Um, Trojans, uh, really this is talking about, it, it's a reference to the Trojan horse. This is a malware that sneaks into your computer and then it opens the front door and allows a whole bunch of other viruses and other types of malware to get into your computer. When, it talk, when we talk about ransomware, which is the second one on this list here, um, you're talking about a, a special type of malware who's going to do two things. It's either, it's either going to encrypt your system and lock you out of your files, right? And then it'll tell you that you have to pay that hacker in Bitcoin or, or gift cards or something to unlock your computer. Um, or if you're an organization, it's gonna, they're gonna also take that data and upload it to one of their, you know, cyber crime servers. And then they are going to tell you that they, if you don't pay them a ransom, they are gonna release that on the dark web and you know, just put it up to the highest bidder, release it all on the internet. Um, adware is just you know malware that gets on your computer and starts bringing up all sorts of pop-ups and you know junk on your computer. Uh, spyware uh, will they will steal your passwords. They will basically log everything that you're typing on your computer and send it back to the hackers. Uh, if you get something called a worm on your computer, that tends to spread to other computers that you have. So if you have more than one device on your in in your home network, uh, a worm could potentially infect all the devices, not just one. And then a botnet is kind of like almost a, a final stage. This is where the hacker has already uh, infiltrated your computer. They have viruses. They have all sorts of things on your computer, and now they're just using their computer for whatever their bidding is. They can use your computer to um, carry out an attack against another company. Uh, they call it a botnet because they have a whole bunch of other computers that they've taken over and turned into what they call zombies. And they'll use hundreds of thousands of computers to carry out an attack against a single company, uh, right? And so your computer would just be part of that, you know, botnet, a zombie in that botnet, you know, carrying out illegal or illicit activities uh, on, the hackers, on the hacker's behalf. How to protect yourself against malware. Super important for you to update your computer, right? The operating system updates. If you're using Windows, you know, there's something called Windows updates. Uh, make sure that you're getting the latest versions of those updates. They always have uh, 
security updates that are part of those updates. These security updates are critical because they fix uh, weaknesses or vulnerabilities that exist in the operating system code that hackers can take advantage of. Microsoft generally puts out um, security updates once a month um, on the second Tuesday of the month, in fact. So um, most computers, in fact, all Windows computers can set up can be set up to automatically update. Uh, so please reach out to somebody who knows about computers and ask them to help you set up automatic updates on your computers. I actually think that Microsoft has it enabled by default now on modern versions of Windows. Uh, make sure you're using a current antivirus program um, that's super important to keep malware out of your computer. Uh, be very careful with downloads on the internet uh, and attachments uh, and links in your email. Uh, make sure you have uh, backups of your data, especially if you have super important data on your computers. Um, if you get ransomware or some other malware, um, ransomware will encrypt all your files. And if you're not willing to pay that hacker uh, for the decryption of your files, you're going to lose everything. Uh, and then there's some malware that'll just get on your computer and delete everything or destroy your system. Uh, and then, you know, practice safe browsing. You want to make sure that you're careful about what websites you visit uh, and what you're doing on the internet uh, because it's not all good out there. Everybody knows that. Uh, last thing I want to talk about today is um, the types of scams that hackers are, or these cyber criminals are, are, are carrying out on the internet. Um, I'm only gonna cover a few of them uh, because there are just so many uh, that they're doing out there. Um, and this is kind of a pie chart of, of the breakdown of, of how often uh, these types of scams are reported on the internet. Um, but we'll go into you know specifically what each one of these are. Uh, you have uh, the online shopping scams. So what they'll do here is uh, they'll create fake websites or fake ads that pop up on the sides of legitimate websites. Um, you know, when you visit, you know, a legitimate website it could be uh, Facebook or whatever, there's always advertisement on the sidebars, right? Those are paid advertisements and anybody can pay to advertise and put whatever they want on there. Um, sometimes the companies like Facebook or whatever, they control what types of ads are put on there, uh, but it's very common for malicious ads to show up there. Uh, or fake ads. Um, and what will happen is that these scammers will um, create these fake ads. You usually see super deep discounted items and um, they'll want you to, when, when you engage with that ad and you say you wanna buy the item, uh, the person who's selling it will tell you, well, um, actually I need you to pay me through Zelle or I need you to pay me by sending me gift cards. That's always a really strong red flag is when they ask for gift cards. Never pay anybody with gift cards unless it's like your friend or somebody who you actually know. Um, yeah, but Zelle, the, you know, if you if you see something that's like seventy five percent off, uh, and then you click on it, you're gonna actually try to buy it, and the person's like, "Well, send me the money through Zelle." Um, if you pay somebody through Zelle, uh, you're never getting that money back. First of all, uh, and it's very likely you'll never get the product either uh, when you fall for these types of scams. Um, so some red flags are again, prices are too good to be true. Uh, the web design is pretty poor, uh, or you see these weird ads on the sides of legitimate websites. Uh, they don't have secure checkout, so you won't see that secure lock or the HTTPS that they always tell you to look for. Uh, and they insist on payments through gift cards, Zelle, you know, Venmo, something like that. Um, so make sure you verify the website's authenticity. Uh, make sure that when you click on that ad that you're going to a legitimate, well-known website. Uh, always use secure payment methods. Um, you know, go through a secure channel. You can use uh, PayPal. Uh, using uh, credit cards uh, is a good way to pay online uh, because generally most banks and credit unions have some sort of uh, fraud protection uh, for credit cards. Um, and so that's a, a, another a safer way to pay for it uh, than using Zelle or using, you know, uh, some other way. Uh, and then check reviews um, from other, in the, uh, other people uh, for those websites in particular. Um, if you can't find reviews for a particular website, uh, then it's likely a shady website. Um, there's a, a, a website called fake spot, uh, which checks reviews for like Amazon and other sites. Uh, you can use that to see, to detect if there's any fake reviews that are being left behind. It's a good, good little tool. Employment scams are another one. Um, people are going to post fake job postings. And the whole purpose of this is for them to get you to give them all your personal details, right? Because when you apply for a job, 
essentially you're, um, you know, you have to fill out an application and that application is very common for them to ask you for your social security number, your date of birth, basically your entire life story. And, um, and people don't blink an eye at that because they're applying for a job and that's normal, right? But these scam artists know that and they're going to put up fake job listings that look, again, too good to be true, right? You see the example one that's up on the screen here. This is definitely one that's too good to be true, right? But people will click on it and people will, will do this, especially younger people who have no experience uh, and are looking to just get into the job market, right? Um, you want to make sure that you research company thoroughly. Uh, when you're applying for a job to make sure that they are a legitimate company. Um, definitely never pay for a job offer. A lot of these scams, uh, employment scams, are going to ask you to pay a fee for applic an application fee. That's very unusual um, that a company would ask you to pay an application fee to apply for a job. And so that's a clear red flag right there. And then be cautious of whatever information you're sharing. Obviously, if you're applying for a job, a legitimate job, they're going to ask you for sensitive information. But be aware of that, uh, because if it is not a legitimate job, you're giving all that information up. Social media scams. Uh, this is basically just a variation of social engineering being carried out through social media instead of through uh, email, text, and, and voice calls. Um, so it's it's basically the same thing. Um, you have you know the scams, the the uh, the same type of threatening language or urgency or things that will show up the, through direct messages or through posts on, on social media. Um, so just make sure that you verify the people who you're actually talking to, um, verify their identity through independent means. Don't rely on social media to verify their identity. Uh, just take a step back, take a deep breath, and really you know use some common sense here. You know Think about what you're doing and what people are asking you to do on social media. Uh, because, you know, you're not seeing people's faces on social media. You don't know uh, if they really are who they say they are, and oftentimes they're not. The relative of their grandparent scam, and I say relative here because it happens to it happens to more than just grandparents, right? Uh, it could be targeting you as a, as, as a sibling, as a, any other type of relative, or even a friend, right? I've received these types of scam phone calls myself, right? It's like, 15 years ago, I received one of these and they just said that they were my long lost whatever, right? Um, and they were in trouble and they needed my help. Um, and oftentimes what they'll do is, you know, they'll, they'll call you, uh, they'll just, you know, they'll either use AI voice cloning, right? Which is very dangerous. Uh, or they'll call you and they'll be like, hey, don't you recognize my voice? You know, it's me. And they'll try to prompt you into saying, oh, you know, um, James or, or, or Cindy, uh, and then they'll be like, oh yeah, that's, that's who I am. Right. And then you, you've already connected that person on the other side of the phone with the person who you believe they are. Right. And they've used that psychological manipulation right there to get you to believe that. Um, and then they start telling you that, you know, they give you the whole story that they're in trouble, uh, and that they need your help. Um, very often, this is a, a, a scam that happens where, um, like a grandson is calling their grandparent and telling them that they're in trouble, that they've been arrested, that they need bailout money. And please don't tell my parents because I'm going to get in trouble, you know? And so grandparents are always, you know, very soft hearted and they want to help and uh, they think they're being helpful, but they're actually getting scammed. And so we always say, you know, always, you know, call the person back at a known phone number, you know, call the parents of your grandson or granddaughter, even if you think they're going to get in trouble because it's better for that to happen than for you to get scammed out of hundreds of thousands of dollars. Relationship or romance scam. Um, this happens in on dating websites, on social media. Um, you know, what'll happen is you, you end up with somebody whose profile seems too good to be true, right? Uh, going back to the common sense factor. Um, they never want to meet in person and they generally don't do video chats with you. Uh, the relationship starts to move really quickly. Um, they always break promises to see you in person. Um, then they tell you that something is terribly wrong, right? They'll tell you that they got cancer or that they had a terrible accident uh, and they need you to send them money to help them. And because you're in love with them, you're going to go ahead and send them that money. Um, another thing they can do is they start asking you for a lot of personal details or information, or they'll ask you for compromising photos or videos of you and then use that to blackmail you. And it can be, you know, it can take a really dark turn at that point. Uh, these scams are not just financially damaging, they're also emotionally damaging and psychologically damaging for a lot of people. Uh, so they are very dangerous. 
And so some of the things that we can do to protect ourselves, um, just be really careful with who you interact with online. Always, always verify the identity of who you're talking to, right? If a person's not willing to meet you uh, on video or in person, and by the way, videos can also be faked. So be very careful with that, especially with today's AI technology. Um, if they're not willing to verify you know, who they actually are or meet in person, that's a clear red flag. Never give money to anyone uh, that, uh, in a, where, who you're in a relationship with, who you've never actually met. Um, look for the red flags that we described previously in the previous slide. Don't share personal information with people who you've never met or don't know and you think you're in a relationship with. And always be suspicious of financial requests from these individuals. Tech support scam, I'll go through quickly. Uh, you know, you'll generally you'll be uh, browsing a website and then you'll have this uh, kind of pop up that'll take up your entire screen and it'll say something is wrong with your computer. We detected a virus. Uh, your computer's running super slow. You need to call us immediately. Right. A lot of times Microsoft is used right in these scams. They'll say, you know, call Microsoft for support. Um, when you call these people, generally they'll want you to pay them to fix your computer. Um, if you go ahead and do that, they're going to take your credit card information. They're going to charge you probably like $499. And then they'll ask you to go to a website uh, where they will have you download a software that will allow them to remote control your computer. And then they'll use that to install malware on your computer and set up your computer so that they can control it in the future, uh, a botnet or a zombie. Uh, you've effectively just paid $499 to have malware installed on your computer and have... Um, and have your credit card information be compromised because now they're going to use your credit card for other things as well, right? This happens through, you know, it can happen on your computer when you're browsing your website. It can happen through phone calls. Uh, they just call you and tell you, hey, your computer is running slow. Uh, you know, we need to fix it for you. People actually fall for that. I don't know why, but it's like, how do you know my computer is running slow? You know, but, you know, people fall for that. Uh, phone calls, text messages, you know, same thing, you know, and then emails, uh, you'll receive an email. It's the same type of scam or message. Some tips to protect yourselves from these types of scams, right? All of the, the scams that we've talked about in general, don't respond to unsolicited requests, right? If you're not asking for a product or a service, right? And that's being offered to you, it's called spam, right? A lot of times the spam could be malicious, right? So don't respond to these things. Um, verify the identity of the person you're interacting with, right? It's super important for you to do that, especially when you're going to pay somebody. And then most critically, never pay somebody you don't know with a wire transfer, a gift card, cryptocurrency, and I'll actually add, you know, Zelle and other products like that to the list. Because once you pay them with these things, you're never getting your money back, right? There's no way for you to call a bank and be like, hey, uh, you know, hey, credit union, I'm sorry, but I, I made this payment accidentally. You're, you're just not getting it back. There's no way for us to help you with that. Okay, and what do you do if you do get scammed? First, stop immediately interacting with the scammer or the cyber criminal, right? Contact your financial institution right away and let them know what's happened so that they can put a plan into place to help you secure your account. File a re report with police, with the police, um, if it was an online crime, you can follow a report with the police and with the FBI. They have a website where you can go do that. Uh, and then contact the credit bureaus, bureaus. You only need to contact one credit bureau and let them know that you've had fraud. Uh, and then, you know, you can turn on what's called a fraud alert on your account. That credit bureau is required by law to inform the other credit bureaus of the fraud that's occurred. And they'll put fraud alerts on your accounts as well. Right. And then go to a website, www.identitytheft.gov. It's a government website that will help you with identity theft. Uh, they'll help you to understand, you know, what your options are, what happened. They'll help you to set up a recovery plan and to notify all the proper authorities uh, and to get your life back. Uh, because a lot of times when these things happen, um, you know, it, it kind of destroys people's lives. And, and it's a very difficult process. It takes years for people to recover uh, when they've lost their identity to these criminals online. Some final thoughts for you today. Uh, assume that your information is already out there. Uh, too many large or organizations have been breached, right? I mean, look at the dates on these. These, these are the last couple of months here. Um, you've have, you know, February, you have Loan Depot, 17 million accounts were compromised. And, and this is social security number, you know, account numbers, date of births. 
we're talking about serious personal information here. Change Healthcare, huge, huge breach with them. Uh, they're a subsidiary of United Healthcare, an insurance company. They had over 20, 120 million um, uh, uh, records uh, of American people breached or leaked to the internet. Uh, that is an ongoing issue for them right now. Uh, AT&T lost the information of 73 million Americans. That included social security numbers. Ticketmaster recently 500 million of their customers uh, had their information stolen. Um, it's terrible what's going on. So you have to assume that your information is already out there and take steps to protect yourself. Subscribe to ID protection, right? You can get it for free um, because anytime that one of these organizations gets breached, they're going to send you free credit monitoring services, right? Take advantage of that. Um, actually change healthcare. I'll talk about that in a second. They are offering uh, two years free to anyone who believes that they were impacted by this. You don't have to be impacted by it. You just have to think that you've been impacted by it and they're going to give it to you. So essentially they're giving it to everyone for free. And I'll put up the details of that in a moment so you can uh, see and, uh, and go to their site. Um, check your credit report. Uh, often, every, everyone can check their credit report at least once a year for free, right? Annualcreditreports.gov. Um, and then use the fraud alerts, right? Fraud alerts are uh, a tool that you have when you believe you have, you've had fraud uh, or identity theft. Uh, if you actually have had a confirmed case of identity theft, you can turn on a, an extended fraud re uh, report or fraud alert that protects you for seven years. And for seven years, anyone who tries to open credit on your behalf that organization who they're trying to open credit with, whether it's a financial institution or a store or whoever, they have to contact you and verify your identity before credit is allowed to be issued, right? Uh, check your financial accounts or your credit union accounts. Make sure that you're logging in and you're checking your statements uh, often so that you can find things. Often uh, financial institutions have limits on reporting fraud. If you don't report fraud in a timely manner, then it's very difficult uh, for financial institutions to help you. So you have to be on top of your finances and checking your accounts. Enabling e-alerts is also super important. Um, most financial institutions uh, have these alerts where every time a transaction occurs, you get a notification. We at EdFed have that. You can go into your mobile app, you can go into your desktop digital banking and turn on alerts so that every time a transaction happens, you'll get a push notification and at the top of your phone, you'll say, hey, you just spent $25 at uh, Exxon, you just spent $50 at, you know, whatever your favorite restaurant is, you'll get those notifications immediately uh, when those transactions occur. That's super important for us to stay on top of our finances and make sure that our credit cards and our financial accounts have not been compromised. And then another important thing is uh, use the TAP when paying for with credit and debit cards. Uh, TAP payments are the most secure payments. It's very difficult for, for criminals to uh, skim your cards or steal your card information when you're using TAP. Uh, so that is by far the most secure method for you to pay with today. Our EdFed cards support TAP payments, so go ahead and use that as much as you want. And then remember, if it's too good to be true, it probably is, right? And that's my final thought for you today. Uh, here's the information I told you about. Uh, credit monitoring and identity protection services uh, offered by, I think it's IDX is the name of the organization who's offering it. If you go to this URL right here, uh, you can register for two years of free credit monitoring and identity, th identity theft protection. This is for individuals who believe that they've been impacted by this United Healthcare and Change Healthcare breach, um, which they uh, anticipate is affecting one third of Americans throughout the United States. Um, so it's very likely that you've been impacted by this. Um, they're not asking you to verify that you've been impacted. Uh, you can just go to this website and sign up uh, for the two years of free credit monitoring and identity protection. Uh, very good service. So please take advantage of that. Um, any questions? Thank you very much, uh, by the way, for, for listening to me. I know it's gone on a little longer than we anticipated, uh, but you know it's super important we talk about this. And uh, I will uh, take some questions at this time. Cindy, do we have any questions yes. lined up? So first of all, thank you so much, Lewis, uh, for sharing yeah. this.
valuable information. I know we ran a little long, but I will tell you that this was incredible. We do have a few questions, so I'm going to go ahead and get them started. Um, I have a question here from a member. Is it safe to say that all government and state information is never texted or emailed? Is that like a good assumption that none of the or you know government organizations will be texting us? Yeah, I, I, unfortunately, we can't make that blanket statement. Um, probably uh, more and more, the government is trying to make use of, of, of all the different channels that are available to it. I think I've seen it on the insurance side, like Medicare and things like that. Um, I've not yet seen it where the IRS or, or the Social Security Agency or, or, or anything like that are, are texting or emailing you. Uh, generally speaking, the government likes to send things through official mail. Um, so it's not common for them to call you. It's not common for them to text you. Um, I think I've only ever seen it through like Medicare and those types of things. Um, but it's never sensitive information. It's always maybe like appointment information or things like that. Um, I would say it's a good rule of thumb for sure. Uh, and it's definitely a red flag. If you see that an official government agency is texting you, it's, um, uh, send you an email or calling you. Yeah. Okay. I have another question from a member that says on EdFed, I keep getting a pop-up window, uh, seeing something about a valid certificate. Is that real? If they see something about a valid certificate on their browser. Yeah. So if you're visiting the EdFed website and you're seeing that, it's definitely important for you to uh, call and, and notify. I can tell you for sure that right now, uh, going to the EdFed website, you should not see any valid certificate uh, errors or issues like that. Um, that is something that we're always on top of. Uh, and just to be clear, a certificate is, um, it, it's basically a, an independent authority that is certifying that our website is encrypted, right? And safe for people to use. So if you're seeing a, a an error that says that the certificate is not valid, what it's saying is that encryption to that website is kind of broken, right? And so it's, it, Technically, it's not safe for you to visit that website or interact with that website. And there could be various reasons that you could be seeing that. Um, one reason is that there could be malware installed on your computer and the hackers might be redirecting you through another site before you get to the EdFed site and they're uh, capturing all the information that you're typing in. Uh, another reason is that you may not actually be on the real EdFed site. You might be on a cloned website that uh, malicious actors set up to trick you into believing you're going to the EdFed website, but you're actually not. Uh, from the EdFed site, we do a lot of scanning of the internet to find those websites and take them down. We work with the authorities to find uh, cloned EdFed websites uh, and take them down before our members can get to them. But you know, the hackers, the, the, the cyber criminals are always putting them up, you know, and they do that a lot faster than we can find them and take them down. So there's always that gap. Um, I would definitely encourage you to, you know, reach out to a, a computer professional, have them take a look at your computer, have them take a look at, at the details of that certificate error to find out why you're getting that. Um, you can also try to go to the website on your phone, right, and see if you're getting the same error. Um, and like I said, it's it's highly unlikely um, that our website would be getting a would, would be giving a legitimate certificate error uh, because that's something that we would be alerted to very quickly. And that we would be on top of and repair very quickly, like like same day type of a thing if we found it. Um, and so, yeah, if you're seeing that, definitely uh, reach out to somebody, a computer professional or somebody to take a look at that um, so they can see what's wrong. Okay, I have another question here. And they're asking um, if something's showing up on as a device connected to their home Wi-Fi. So they're asking, like, what is... Uh, China draw DRA specifically it's just a name that's popping up that it looks like it's connected uh, a device that's connected to their home Wi-Fi and hopefully we're all using a protected network at home uh, but if we do see something like that what should we do and who is that yeah. if you've ever heard of China DRA so no I've never I'm heard of somebody that before um, now um, when you have uh, I guess more modern uh home Wi-Fi routers or, or, or networks that are set up. Um, a lot of times that, you know, the Comcast, the AT&Ts of the world, they'll give you a gateway for your Wi-Fi and that'll be set up to like notify you when new things connect to your network. Or you can also log into those um, devices and see who's connected, right? So more like more than likely you're logged in or you're getting a notification that, you know, from this type of service that a device has connected to your network. 
um, it's very difficult for anyone to say what those devices are uh, because the manufacturer of the device can basically put whatever they want on there as the device name. Um, if it says something like China DRA, it could be legitimate. I'm not saying that it, it's something that could be a uh, uh, you know, hacker or something that's in there. Um, it could just be that you have a device that was manufactured in China and that's what the manufacturer decided that they're gonna put as the name of the device. Uh, a lot of things are manufactured in China, by the way, so it's not uncommon. However, um, and, and uh, the other thing I'll say is that we have so many devices now that are connecting to our home Wi-Fi network, right? That you may not even be aware of, right? So you, you buy a new appliance or something um, and it's, it's not unlikely for that appliance to connect to the Wi-Fi network and you may not even know that it's connecting, right? Also, you have uh, people constantly walking close to your house or into your home, you know, and their devices might be attempting to connect to your Wi-Fi network as well. Um, and it really depends on how open your Wi-Fi network is. Most people have it where they have a secure network and you have to put in a password to connect. Uh, that's definitely what's recommended. Um, I would suggest if you're, if you're concerned, uh, you can try to log into your device and kick that device off of your network, remove it, um, or have somebody who, who's familiar with computers and, and network equipment come take a look at it uh, and see if they can identify what device it is. Uh, but like I said, most homes nowadays, it's likely that we have dozens of devices that are already connected to our Wi-Fi network. So it's it's uh, definitely a not easy thing for us to identify. No, that's a great point for sure. A lot of the new technology of appliances all want to get on. Mm -hmm. um, I do want to state that this this recording is going to be shared on our YouTube channel, which is EdFed TV. So for sure, you all have access to that. Um, I do have a couple more questions. I, I will re remind you, please, to put your questions on the Q&A function as everybody's been muted. Um, let's see here I have, can we get a copy of this presentation? Yes, you're gonna have it on our YouTube channel. Uh, let's see, do you recommend, recommend a VPN? It's a question from a member. Yeah, that's a good question. So VPN is, um, there are a lot of legitimate services out there. Um, certainly if you wanna stay anonymous while you're browsing the internet, it's recommended that you use a VPN. Um, I've used one of myself, uh, you know, for multiple reasons. Um, and, and really what the VPN is gonna do is help you to stay anonymous. So when you're visiting, you know, certain websites, they're not able to obtain, you know, specific information from you, uh, particularly your location is one of them. Um, a lot of websites, just by visiting them, they're gonna be able to see certain amounts of information uh, that can identify you. Um, and so, you know, if you use a VPN, it's a, it's slight, a, a safer way to browse the internet uh, and it's going to help you. Uh, some VPN services add additional services uh, like cybersecurity protection and, and, you know, they do things like stop you from browsing to malicious websites. It really just depends on the service that you subscribe to. Uh, but a VPN service is, is definitely something that's helpful for privacy and, you know, just to protect your, your identity a little bit more online. Okay, I have a couple more questions. I have one from a member that says, if I receive an email saying that I have been hacked, what should I do? So we did cover a few things of where to go, identitytheft.org, uh, checking annualcreditreport.com. But in general, because um, you keep mentioning, you know, a computer yeah. professional, is there okay. a company that you would recommend, an organization? Like, where can they find reputable companies or who they can reach out to? Yeah, um, unfortunately, I'm, I'm, I can't recommend anyone uh, right now, just, I mean, reach out to somebody you trust who knows about computers. Um, you know, there's always like paid services. Like I, I think Best Buy may still have their geek squad and things like that, right? Where mm -hmm. they do tech support services. Uh, but I, I'm not recommending them. I'm just saying that they exist. Right. Uh, those right. are the types of services that you can go and, and, and pay a professional to look at your computer. Um, mm -hmm. And the original question was what again? Oh, so if, if they received, received an email. An email. Yeah, right, so that, that, sounds, that sounds to me like your typical type of tech support scam, right? Remember where I said you could receive this through email where it says, you know, you've been hacked or there's something on your computer, you know, please call us so we can help you fix it. Um, generally, those are the, the scammers and the, you know, the cyber criminals that are sending those emails to you just to get you to click on their links. Um, it's definitely uh, a, a very suspicious email. Um, if you if you are suspicious or you believe that your computer has been hacked, there are generally clear signs um, of that. It, you know, your computer could be running slowly. There could be a lot of pop-ups on your computer. Um, there could be just weird things that are going on. 
Um, you can have, uh, you know, accounts that are being compromised. So maybe you're, mm -hmm. you're getting a lot of notifications from those um, sites that you commonly log into like Google or your, or your financial institutions that are telling you that your passwords have been breached or that your passwords are compromised, change your passwords. Um, if you're seeing that a lot, um, then I start to get suspicious and I start to think about getting somebody, you know, professionals to look at my computer. Um, you know, but it sounds that that could be a tech support scam and just a phishing email. Okay. Um, I do have another one. It says, what happens if somebody hacks you with a USB cord? So is that a possibility if you're taking your computer somewhere or sharing your computer with somebody and somebody puts in their USB cord, mm -hmm. they're, you know, they're, you're granting them access to your computer, obviously. So right. it says, what happens if somebody hacks you with a USB cord? Like at that time, you know, if somebody gets a virus or something on their computer, what can they do once that yeah. already happens? So, I mean, that could happen. Um, anyone who plugs in anything to your computer or your device, um, you're you're essentially trusting that person, right? So you should never allow anyone who you don't trust to plug anything into your device. Um, but if they if if it does happen, right, and you do get some malware or some, you know, some they they are able to hack or breach your computer. Uh, I I go back to the same thing. It's like you got to reach out to a professional service uh, who understands that sort of thing that can help you. You should have uh, an anti malware or an antivirus installed on your computer. Uh, a current one. There's there's a, a few of them out there. You know everybody's heard of Norton. Uh, another good one is Bitdefender. Um, you know there's several other companies out there. Uh, that have anti-malware. Microsoft has one called Defender. Um, there's a free version that comes with Windows uh, that Microsoft gives you. Um, it's it's uh, it's decent, um, but if you're paying for an antivirus service, then obviously you're going to get a much better service and a more a product that covers your computer more thoroughly and it protects you better. So um, I did definitely would recommend everyone have a a, a strong antivirus installed on their computer. Uh, that would help uh, prevent things like somebody, if somebody plugs you know, something into your computer and tries to get malware on there, a good antivirus program should stop that from occurring. Uh, but if you've already been breached or suspect that you've had your computer hacked or, or that malware is on there, uh, that's the point where you have to have somebody clean your computer out. And if you're not comfortable doing that yourself, then you have to hire you know, a computer professional or somebody to help you with that. Okay. And I know you did mention when we have people in our home, you know, obviously their devices try to get access to our Wi-Fi network at times. Um, but I have a great member question here that says, should we give password access to company workers doing work on equipment in our home, such as the AC, heating equipment, anybody who's coming to do work in our home, should we grant them access to our network? Um, well, that's a very personal decision. I would not recommend it because remember what I said, don't give access to anyone you don't trust, right? To your right. Wi-Fi, to your devices. If you don't trust that person, um, don't give access to them. Sometimes uh, these cyber criminals, and it's, I wouldn't say that it's common that somebody is going to come into an individual person's home to do this, um, right? But it's very common in organizations where these scam artists and these, these cyber criminals will dress up and, and, and role play. You know, maybe they'll pretend to be the pest control company or they'll pretend to be the telecom company. They'll think, they'll, they'll say they're an engineer from AT&T, you know, and they'll walk into the company and say, hey, I need to check your back room. I'm from AT&T, right? And they're just a scam artist and they're going in there to plant devices and, and you know, try to gain access to your network. So if you translate that to individual homes, it's very, it's less likely that a scam artist or somebody's actually gonna go in your home and do that um, because you're just, you know, one person. Uh, as opposed to a bigger target like a company where they can get more out of that. Uh, but mm -hmm. it's not it's not unheard of. Uh, and I would definitely continue to recommend if you don't trust a person, don't grant them access to your Wi-Fi. Don't grant them access to, you know, the the, uh, uh, the the devices that you have, allowing them to plug things in and things of that nature. No, and I 100% I agree with that. Again, you said it's very personal, but I do know, and I've heard of this example many times we do with financial ed, but when we're talking about a company like Target, for example, that's how mm -hmm. some of their data breaches have been done because people get on there to do work at the, or at the, at the store yep. and maybe Target is protected, but that company, that subcontractor is not as protected. And that's so exactly sometimes right. that's what happens. 
Um, but I do have one more question for you. Um, you did mention about messaging and text and voice calls, but I have heard um, a lot about other organizations like that contact you through threads. So like if you're working with a financial institution and you're getting like text message notifications about transactions, can somebody find their way like a hacker to message you as well through the text, through that same text thread? Because I know that they're doing it with the phone, you know, the phone numbers and things like that. I wonder if that's also something that's happening just so that we're hyper aware. Yeah. Um, I, I, okay. I'll say it's not beyond the realm of impossibility. Um, okay. it, it could happen, but a hacker would have to be extremely sophisticated um, to take over like a thread like that. Um, and like a text messaging thread, particularly one that your financial institution is sending you messages on uh, uh, mm -hmm. transaction notification messages on. I would not consider that a common scenario. That would have to be a very niche scenario where a hacker decided that they're going to, you know, specifically go after something like that. Uh, and they would have to be very sophisticated uh, and have a lot of access to, you know, cell phone companies and things like that. Um, yeah. So I, I, I wouldn't worry too much about that use case or that scenario. Okay. Um, we have, I know we have some some members kind of raising their hand. I, I would remind you to, if you can please put it in the chat, which is the only way that I can see the questions here. Um, but I think that so far, I think we've answered a lot of the questions that have been on here. I've gotten a lot of thank yous for sharing this information. Um, I have here, I'm a senior citizen. Every time I go into my account, they give me so many security codes to verify uh, to verify if I'm a human being or a bot, you know, also I have to verify security questions. So, you know, like Lewis said, all of these security questions are there to protect us. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I think, you know, just, just a reminder to have some patience with anything that it is trying to protect our accounts and our information. Um, but a lot of these questions are the same, you know, about VPN and about sharing this presentation. Uh, so at this time, if we don't have any more, I do want to thank everybody for joining us. Uh, for this EdFed Academy presentation about cybersecurity. Um, but again, ton of valuable information today. Louis, thank you so much. You're welcome, Thank you, Cindy. everybody, for being on this call and spending your Saturday morning with us. And we hope to see you again.